Hello, and welcome to another episode of ADHD History. I am your host, Xander Millett, here to tell you the history of the world in no particular order. Today, our journey takes us into the captivating world of Mary, Queen of Scots. Her life story is one of intrigue, drama, and enduring significance. Throughout this episode, I'll delve into the twists and turns of Mary's life, from her rise to the throne to her reign as a Scottish monarch. Mary was born on December 8, 1542, in Linlithgow Palace, Scotland, to King James V and his French second wife, Mary of Guise. She was said to have been born prematurely and was the only legitimate child of James to survive him. She was the great-granddaughter of King Henry VII of England through her paternal grandmother, Margaret Tudor. Margaret was Henry VIII's older sister, so Mary was Henry VIII's great-niece. On December 14th, six days after her birth, she became Queen of Scotland when her father died perhaps from the effects of a nervous collapse following the Battle of Solway Moss, or from drinking contaminated water while on campaign. A popular tale, first recorded by John Knox, states that James, upon hearing on his deathbed that his wife had given birth to a daughter, ruefully exclaimed, It came with a lass and it will go with a lass. His House of Stuart had gained the throne of Scotland in the 14th century, via the marriage of Marjorie Bruce, daughter of Robert the Bruce, to Walter Stewart, sixth high steward of Scotland. The crown had come to his family through a woman and would be lost from his family through a woman. This prophecy would come true, but not until much later. Not through Mary, but through her great-great-granddaughter Anne, Queen of Great Britain. English diplomat Ralph Sadler, who saw the infant in March 1543, attested to her robust health, describing her as a goodly child as I have ever seen of her age. As Mary was an infant when she inherited the throne, Scotland was ruled by regents until she became an adult. From the outset, there were two claims to the regency, one from the Catholic Cardinal Beaton and the other from the Protestant Earl of Arran, who was next in line to the throne. Beaton's claim to power rested on a contested version of the king's will, while Arryn's position was bolstered by his proximity to the throne and support from various factions. Arryn became the regent until 1554, when Mary's mother managed to remove and succeed him. Meanwhile, across the border, King Henry VIII of England saw an opportunity to forge a strategic alliance with Scotland through marriage. In 1543, the the Treaty of Greenwich was negotiated, proposing a union between Mary and Henry's son and heir, Edward. The treaty outlined plans for Mary to marry Edward at the age of 10, with the intention of strengthening ties between Scotland and England. The treaty provided that the two countries would remain legally separate and, if the couple should fail to have children, the temporary union would dissolve. Cardinal Beaton's rising back to power was another shift in Scottish politics, as he pursued a pro-Catholic, pro-French agenda that clashed with the ambitions of King Henry VIII. Beaton sought to strengthen Scotland's ties with France, a move that pissed Henry off, who wanted to sever the Scottish-French alliance. One of Beaton's key strategies was to relocate Mary to the safety of Stirling Castle, away from the coastal regions vulnerable to English raids. Despite initial resistance from Regent Arran, Beaton's armed supporters gathered at Linlithgow, prompting Arryn to concede to the relocation of Mary and her mother to Stirling. The Earl of Lennox facilitated their journey, escorting them with a sizable armed escort to Stirling Castle, where Mary was then crowned in the castle chapel on September 9, 1543. However, tensions between England and Scotland continued to escalate, fueled by Henry's efforts to enforce the Treaty of Greenwich. The rejection of the treaty by the Parliament of Scotland in December 1543 further strained relations between the two kingdoms. In response, Henry launched a military campaign known as the Rough Wooing, aimed at coercing Scotland into accepting the marriage proposal. English forces, led by the Earl of Hartford, carried out raids on Scottish and French territory, intensifying hostilities between the nations. In May 1544, 
Edinburgh fell victim to an English raid, prompting the Scots to relocate Mary once again for her safety. In May 1546, Beaton was murdered by Protestant lords. And September 10th, 1547, nine months after the death of Henry VIII, the Scots suffered a heavy defeat at the Battle of Pinkey. Mary's guardians, fearful for her safety, sent her to a priory and turned to the French for help. King Henry II of France proposed to unite France and Scotland by marrying the young queen to his three-year-old son, the Dauphin Francis. On the promise of French military help and a French dukedom for himself, Arran agreed to the marriage. In February 1548, Mary was moved, again for her safety, to Dumbarton Castle. The English left a trail of devastation behind them once more and seized the strategic town of Haddington. In June, the much-awaited French help finally arrived to besiege and ultimately take Haddington back. On July 7, 1548, a Scottish parliament held at a nunnery near the town agreed to the French marriage treaty. Mary would stay in France 13 years following her marriage agreement. Accompanied by her own court and the, quote, four Marys, who were all young girls from noble Scottish families, Mary set sail from Dumbarton on August 7, 1548, aboard a French fleet. Arriving in Brittany, Mary's entourage included her governess, Lady Fleming, who was later succeeded by a French governess, Francois de Perroy. Described as vivacious, beautiful, and clever, Mary thrived in the French court environment, becoming a favorite among courtiers, except for Henry II's wife, Catherine de de Medici. She received a comprehensive education, excelling in various pursuits such as music, literature, horsemanship, falconry, and languages, which included French, Italian, Latin, Spanish, and Greek, in addition to her native Scottish. Despite her promising childhood, Mary faced challenges, including a bout of smallpox, which, fortunately, left no lasting marks on her features. Portraits of Mary depict her with a small, oval-shaped head, bright auburn hair, hazel brown eyes, and a tall stature, exceeding the average height for women in the 16th century. Despite her physical beauty, Mary was also known for her eloquence and intellect. On April 4, 1558, Mary signed a secret agreement bequeathing Scotland and her claim to England to the French crown if she died without children. Twenty days later, she married the Dauphin at Notre Dame de Paris, and he became the king consort of Scotland. In November 1558, Henry VIII's elder daughter, Mary I of England, was succeeded by her only surviving sibling, Elizabeth I. Under the Third Succession Act, passed in 1543, Elizabeth was recognized as her sister's heir, and Henry VIII's last will and testament had excluded the Stuarts from succeeding to the English throne. Yet, in the eyes of many Catholics, Elizabeth was illegitimate, and Mary Stuart was the rightful Queen of England, as the senior surviving legitimate descendant of Henry VII through her grandmother, Margaret Tudor. Henry II of France proclaimed that his eldest son and daughter-in-law were King and Queen of England. In France, the royal arms of England were quartered with those of Francis and Mary, pissing Elizabeth off. Mary's claim to the English throne was a constant sticking point between her and Elizabeth. Mark my words, when you least expect it, your uppance will come. Following the death of Henry II on July 10th, 1559, his 15-year-old son Francis and 16-year-old Mary ascended to the French throne, becoming queen and king of France. However, the real power behind the throne lay with Mary's uncles, the Duke of Guise and the Cardinal of Lorraine, who wielded significant influence in French politics a period often described as the tyranny of the Guises. Meanwhile, in Scotland, the Protestant lords of the congregation were gaining strength at the expense of Mary's mother, who struggled to maintain control with the assistance of French troops. In early 1560, the Protestant lords sought support from English troops to bolster Protestantism in Scotland. However, a Huguenot uprising in France 
known as the Tumult of Amboise, prevented further French support. Instead, the Guise brothers sent ambassadors to negotiate a settlement. On June 11, 1560, Mary's mother passed away, intensifying the urgency of resolving future Franco-Scottish relations. The Treaty of Edinburgh, signed by Mary's representatives on July 6, 1560, stipulated the withdrawal of French and English troops from Scotland. France also recognized Elizabeth I's legitimacy as the ruler of England. However, 17-year-old Mary, still grieving for her mother and residing in France, refused to ratify the treaty. King Francis II's unexpected death on December 5, 1560, cast a shadow over Mary's world. His death, attributed to a middle ear infection culminating in a brain abscess, left the young queen devastated. With Francis gone, the reins of power fell to his mother, Catherine de' Medici, who assumed the regency for Francis's 10-year-old brother, Charles IX. Catherine's role as regent thrust Mary into an uncertain future. Mary made the decision to return to her native Scotland, arriving on August 19, 1561. However, her homecoming was not without its challenges. Having spent the majority of her formative years in the sophisticated courts of France, Mary found herself ill-prepared for the intricate and volatile political landscape of Scotland. Damn Scots! They ruined Scotland! Mary encountered a realm torn asunder by religious strife. Scotland was deeply divided between Catholic and Protestant factions, with each vying for supremacy. Mary's Catholicism set her at odds with the burgeoning Protestant movement, led by influential figures such as her own half-brother, the Earl of Moray. The Protestant John Knox, in particular, emerged as a vocal critic of Mary's religious practices, condemning her attendance at Catholic Mass, her fondness for dancing, and her opulent attire. Despite attempts to engage with Knox and reconcile their differences, Mary found herself rebuffed at every turn. Knox's scathing denunciations of her character and actions fueled public animosity towards the Queen, exacerbating the already simmering tensions between Catholics and Protestants. To the surprise and dismay of the Catholic party, Mary showed unexpected tolerance towards the emerging Protestant ascendancy in Scotland. Despite her Catholic background, she retained her Protestant half-brother as her chief advisor, signaling a departure from expectations. Her Privy Council, established in September 1561, consisted of 16 members, predominantly Protestant leaders from the Reformation Crisis of 1559-1560. Notably, only four councillors were Catholic, including the Earls of Athol, Arrow, Montrose, and Huntley, the latter being Lord Chancellor. The composition of the council was a significant departure from traditional expectations, suggesting Mary's pragmatic approach to governance and her strategic alignment with English interests, particularly regarding her claim to the English throne. Historian Jenny Wormald suggested that Mary's failure to appoint a council sympathetic to Catholic and French interests was an indication of her focus on the English throne over the internal problems of Scotland. She joined with Moray in the destruction of Scotland's leading Catholic magnate, Lord Huntley, in 1562 after he led a rebellion against her in the Highlands. Mary's diplomatic efforts to secure her position as the heir presumptive to the English throne led to the dispatch of William Maitland of Lethington as her ambassador to the English court. With Elizabeth I hesitant to name a potential successor, fearing threats to her rule, she refrained from making a definitive decision. Nonetheless, Elizabeth privately acknowledged Mary's legitimate claim to the throne, recognizing her as a strong contender. Preparations for a historic meeting between Mary and Elizabeth were underway, slated for August or September 1562 in England, either at York or Nottingham. However, these plans were abruptly canceled due to the eruption of civil strife in France, diverting attention away from the proposed summit. This unforeseen development thwarted Mary's hopes for a face-to-face -face encounter with her cousin, which could potentially have altered the course of history. 
Mary then turned her attention to finding a new husband from the royalty of Europe. When her uncle, the Cardinal of Lorraine, began negotiations with Archduke Charles of Austria without her consent, she angrily objected and the negotiations foundered. Her own attempt to negotiate a marriage to Don Carlos, the mentally unstable heir apparent of King Philip II of Spain, was rebuffed by Philip. In a surprising turn of events, Elizabeth intervened, proposing a marriage between Mary and Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, a prominent English nobleman and Elizabeth's trusted confidant. Elizabeth believed that such a union would serve her interests by aligning Mary closer to English Protestantism and thereby strengthening her own position. The proposal came to nothing, mostly because the intended bridegroom was unwilling to say the least. I apologize to the French because I am not going to pronounce this names correctly whatsoever. <laughs> Pierre de Boscosel de Chasselard, a French poet in Mary's court, became infatuated with the queen, displaying erratic behavior that caused alarm among her attendants. In a dramatic incident in 1563, Chastelard was discovered hiding under Mary's bed during a security search, intending to surprise her and profess his love. This audacious act shocked Mary, prompting her to banish him from Scotland. However, Chastelard persisted in his pursuit of Mary, defying the royal decree. Just days later, he forcibly entered her chamber while she was preparing to go to bed. Mary, feeling threatened and vulnerable, called out for help, prompting her half-brother, Moray, to intervene. Despite Mary's urging, Moray refrained from violence as Chastelard was already restrained by others. Subsequently, Chastelard faced severe consequences for his actions. He was charged with treason and swiftly condemned to death by beheading. Good riddance. William Maitland, a prominent figure in Mary's court, suggested that Chastelard's infatuation was merely a ruse orchestrated as part of a Huguenot conspiracy to discredit Mary and undermine her authority. Mary had briefly met her English-born half-cousin Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, in February 1561 when she was mourning for Francis. Darnley was introduced to her under the guise of offering condolences. Little did Mary know, this meeting was orchestrated by Darnley's parents, hopeful for a union between their son and the Scottish Queen. Both Mary and Darnley were grandchildren of Margaret Tudor, sister of Henry VIII of England, and patrilineal descendants of the High Stewards of Scotland. Their paths crossed again in February 1565 at Weymouth Castle, where Mary found herself captivated by Darnley's towering statue and charm. He's your first cousin. Then I love him first. They married at Holyrood Palace on July 29, 1565. Even though both were Catholic and a papal dispensation for the marriage of first cousins had not been obtained. English statesman William Cecil and the Earl of Leicester had worked to obtain Darnley's license to travel to Scotland from his home in England. Although her advisors had brought the couple together, Elizabeth felt threatened by the marriage because as descendants of her aunt, both Mary and Darnley were claimants to the English throne. Their children, if any, would inherit an even stronger combined claim. The union infuriated Elizabeth, who felt that the marriage should not have gone ahead without her permission, as Darnley was both her cousin and an English subject. Mary's marriage to Lord Donnelly, a prominent Catholic, exacerbated tensions between Catholic and Protestant factions in Scotland even further. Mary's half-brother, the Earl of Moray, joined forces with Protestant lords, including Argyll and Glencairn, in open rebellion against her. Determined to confront the rebels, Mary embarked on a journey from Edinburgh in August 26, 1565. The ensuing conflict, known as the Chase About Raid, saw Mary's forces and Moray's rebels engaging in a prolonged standoff without direct combat. Despite Moray's initial entry into Edinburgh, he failed to seize the castle and ultimately fled Scotland for asylum in England in October. 
Mary, meanwhile, bolstered her support by releasing Lord Huntley's son and welcoming back James Hepburn, 4th Earl of Bothwell, from exile in France. In an attempt to reconcile the divided factions, Mary expanded her Privy Council to include representatives from both Catholic and Protestant backgrounds. This move aimed to mitigate religious tension and foster a more inclusive governing body. Among the new council members were prominent figures such as Bishop John Leslie and Provost Simon Preston of Craig Millar. Alongside Protestant leaders like Bishop Alexander Gordon and Sir James Balfour, Mary's efforts to bridge the religious divide reflected her determination to maintain stability in Scotland amidst escalating strife. Darnley's behavior became increasingly problematic as he sought to assert more power. Unsatisfied with his role as king consort, he demanded the crown matrimonial, which would grant him joint sovereignty over Scotland if he outlived Mary. Mary, however, refused his request, leading to growing tension in their marriage, despite Mary becoming pregnant with their child by October 1565. Darnley's jealousy was fueled by rumors of Mary's close relationship with her Catholic secretary, David Rizzio, who some suspected to be the father of her unborn child. In March 1566, Darnley conspired with Protestant lords, including those who had previously rebelled against Mary, to eliminate Rizzio. On the night of March 9th, a group of conspirators, including Darnley, stormed into Holyrood Palace and fatally stabbed Rizzio in front of Mary during a dinner party. Following Rizzio's murder, Darnley experienced a change of heart and sought reconciliation with Mary, joining forces with her against the conspirators. They fled Holyrood Palace and sought refuge at Dunbar Castle before returning to Edinburgh on March 18th. As a gesture of goodwill, Mary Reedon stated former rebels, including Lords Moray, Argyle, and Glencairn, to her council, signaling a tentative restoration of stability amidst the turmoil. Mary's joy at the birth of her son, James, was overshadowed by the continued strain in her marriage to Darnley following Rizzio's murder. In October 1566, while on a journey to visit the Earl of Bothwell at Hermitage Castle, Mary's actions fueled rumors of an illicit affair between them. Despite being accompanied by her counselors and guards, her enemies later used this journey as evidence of an alleged romantic liaison. Shortly after her return from Hermitage Castle, Mary fell seriously ill, exhibiting symptoms such as vomiting, loss of sight, and convulsions, which led to fears for her life. Her eventual recovery was attributed to the care of her French physicians, though the cause of her illness remains a subject of speculation, ranging from physical exhaustion to poisoning. At Craigmillar Castle in November 1566, Mary and prominent nobles convened to discuss the problem of Darnley. While divorce was considered, a more drastic solution emerged. A bond was likely sworn amongst the lords present to remove Darnley by other means. Darnley, sensing danger, retreated to Glasgow after the baptism of his son, where he fell ill, possibly from smallpox, syphilis, or poisoning, remaining incapacitated for several weeks. In late January 1567, Mary urged Darnley to return to Edinburgh after his illness. He stayed in a house at the former Abbey of Kirko Field, where Mary visited him regularly, suggesting a possible reconciliation. However, on the night of February 9th or 10th, 1567, while Mary attended wedding celebrations, an explosion rocked Kirko Field. Darnley was discovered dead in the garden, apparently smothered, with no visible signs of violence. Suspicion fell on figures close to Mary, including Bothwell, Maury, Secretary Maitland, the Earl of Morton, and even Mary herself. Elizabeth wrote to Mary of the rumors. I should ill fulfill the office of a faithful cousin or an affectionate friend if I did not tell you what all the world is thinking. Men say that, instead of seizing the murderers, you are looking through your fingers while they escape, that you will not seek revenge on those who have done you so much pleasure, 
as though the deed would never have taken place had not the doers of it been assured of impunity. For myself, I beg you to believe that I would not harbor such a thought. By the end of February, suspicion had shifted strongly towards Bothwell as the perpetrator of Darnley's assassination. Lennox, Darnley's father, demanded Bothwell's trial before the Estates of Parliament, which Mary initially agreed to. However, Lennox's request for a delay to gather evidence was denied. Bothwell's trial lasted a mere seven hours on April 12th, with no evidence presented, resulting in his acquittal. Just a week later, Bothwell managed to secure support from over two dozen lords and bishops for his intention to marry the Queen, as evidenced by the Ainsley Tavern Bond. Between April 21st and 23rd, 1567, Mary visited her son at Stirling for what would be the last time. On her return journey from Edinburgh on April 24th, Mary was allegedly abducted by Lord Bothwell and his men and taken to Dunbar Castle. There are suggestions she may have been raped during this time. Mary and Bothwell then returned to Edinburgh on May 6th. On May 15th, they were married at either Holyrood Castle or Holyrood Abbey, according to Protestant rites. It's noteworthy that Bothwell had divorced his first wife, Jean Gordon, just 12 days prior to marrying Mary. Don't be suspicious. Initially, Mary believed she had the support of many nobles for her marriage to Bothwell, who had been elevated to Duke of Orkney. However, their relationship quickly soured, leading to widespread disapproval of the union. Both Catholics and Protestants found fault with the marriage, with Catholics questioning its legality due to Bothwell's divorce and the Protestant service, while both groups were shocked that Mary would marry a man accused of murdering her husband. The marriage itself was chaotic, leaving, leading to Mary's growing depression. 26 Scottish peers, known as the Confederate Lords, turned against Mary and Bothwell, raising their own army in opposition. Bothwell and Mary confronted the Lords at Crowberry Hill on June 15th, but no battle ensued as Mary's forces dwindled through desertion during negotiations. Bothwell was granted safe passage from the field, while Mary was taken to Edinburgh by the Lords, where she faced public condemnation as an adulteress and murderer. That night, she was imprisoned at Lochleven Castle on an island in the middle of Lochleven. Tragically, between July 20th and 23rd, Mary suffered a miscarriage of twins. Finally, on July 24th, she was compelled to abdicate in favor of her one-year-old son, James. Moray assumed the role of regent, while Bothwell was driven into exile. He was then imprisoned in Denmark, which led to his descent into insanity, and he passed away in 1578. On May 2, 1568, Mary managed to escape from Lochleven Castle with the help of George Douglas, brother of Sir William Douglas, who owned the castle. Rallying an army of 6,000 men, she confronted Moray's smaller forces at the Battle of Langside on May 13. However, she suffered defeat and was forced to flee southward. After a brief stop at Dunrinan Abbey, she crossed the Solway Firth into England aboard a fishing boat on May 16th, landing at Workington in Cumberland. There, she sought refuge and spent the night at Workington Hall. On May 18th, local officials took her into protective custody at Carlisle Castle. Mary had hoped that Elizabeth would assist her in reclaiming her throne. However, Elizabeth proceeded cautiously, initiating an inquiry into the actions of the Confederate lords and investigating whether Mary was involved in Darnley's murder. In mid-July 1568, English authorities transferred Mary to Bolton Castle, a location farther from the Scottish border, but not too close to London. A commission of inquiry known as a conference convened in York and later Westminster from October 1568 to January 1569. Meanwhile, in Scotland, Mary's supporters were engaged in civil war against Regent Moray and his successors. As an anointed queen, Mary staunchly refused to acknowledge the authority of any court to try her. 
While she declined to attend the inquiry at York in person, she did send representatives, although Elizabeth forbade her attendance regardless. The centerpiece of the evidence against Mary was the so-called casket letters, eight unsigned letters purportedly from Mary to Bothwell, along with two marriage contracts and a love sonnet. These items were said to have been discovered in a silver gilt casket measuring less than one foot long, adorned with the monogram of King Francis II of France. Mary denied writing these letters, insisting they were forgeries, and pointing out that her handwriting was not difficult to imitate. However, their contents were considered crucial in determining whether Mary bore any responsibility for Darnley's murder. The head of the Commission of Inquiry, the Duke of Norfolk, described them as, quote, horrible letters and, quote, diverse fond ballads. He forwarded copies to Elizabeth, suggesting that if they were authentic, they could prove Mary's guilt. The authenticity of the casket letters has long been a subject of debate among historians, and it remains impossible to definitively prove either their authenticity or their forgery. The original letters, penned in French, were possibly destroyed in 1584 by Mary's son James. The surviving copies, whether in French or translated into English, do not constitute a complete set, further complicating the matter. In the 1570s, incomplete printed transcriptions in English, Scottish, French, and Latin circulated, adding layers of complexity to the analysis. Additionally, other documents scrutinized during the inquiry included Bothwell's divorce from Jean Gordon, for which Moray dispatched a messenger to Dunbar in September to attain a copy of the proceedings from the town's registers. Mary's biographers, including Antonia Fraser, Alison Ware, and John Guy, have offered various conclusions regarding the authenticity of the casket letters. Many believe that either the documents were outright forgeries, or that incriminating passages were inserted into genuine letters, or that the letters were intended for a different recipient altogether. Guy, for instance, notes the disjointed nature of the letters and highlights the poor French language and grammar in the sonnets, suggesting they are inconsistent with Mary's education. However, certain phrases in the letters, along with some stylistic characteristics, align with known writings by Mary, adding further complexity to the whole thing. Interestingly, the casket letters did not emerge publicly until the Conference of 1568, despite the Scottish Privy Council having knowledge of them by December 1567. This delay raises suspicions about their authenticity. Mary had been compelled to abdicate and was held captive for a significant period in Scotland, yet the letters were never used to justify her imprisonment or forced abdication. Historian Jenny Wormald interprets this reluctance on the part of the Scots to produce the letters and their subsequent destruction in 1584 as evidence that they contained genuine incriminating evidence against Mary. Conversely, Ware suggests that this hesitation indicates that the Lords needed time to fabricate the letters. Nonetheless, some of Mary's contemporaries who had seen the letters were convinced of their authenticity. Among them was the Duke of Norfolk, who clandestinely conspired to marry Mary during the commission, although he denied any such intentions when Elizabeth hinted at his marriage plans, claiming he had no intention of marrying anyone without certainty of his safety. The majority of the commissioners ultimately accepted the casket letters as genuine, following a thorough examination of their contents and a comparison of the handwriting with known examples of Mary's penmanship. However, Elizabeth concluded the inquiry without reaching a definitive verdict against either the Confederate lords or Mary. This outcome was driven by political considerations rather than a genuine pursuit of justice. Elizabeth's primary objective was to maintain a delicate balance of power in Scotland, ensuring the dominance of Protestant governance without either condemning or releasing Mary, her fellow sovereign. The Earl of Moray returned to Scotland as regent, consolidating Protestant control, while Mary remained in custody in England. 
Antonia Frazier characterized the entire episode as one of the most peculiar trials in legal history, culminating in an inconclusive outcome where neither party was definitively found guilty or exonerated, allowing one to return to Scotland while the other languished in captivity. Mary's relocation to Tutbury Castle on January 26, 1569, marked a shift in her captivity as she fell under the custody of the Earl of Shrewsbury and his formidable wife, Bess of Hardwick. Elizabeth viewed Mary's aspirations for the English throne as a grave concern, prompting her confinement to Shrewsbury's property strategically scattered throughout the English interior. These properties included Tutbury Castle, Sheffield Castle, Sheffield Manor Lodge, Wingfield Manor, and Chatsworth House, strategically positioned halfway between Scotland and London and distant from the coastline. Despite her captivity, Mary was allowed a considerable degree of autonomy within her confined quarters. She maintained her own domestic staff, which never dwindled below 16 members, and required an impressive 30 carts to transport her extensive belongings from one residence to another. Her chambers were adorned with luxurious tapestries, carpets, and a cloth of state embroidered with the French phrase, En ma fin est ma commencement, or in my much better English, in my end lies my beginning. <laughs> Her daily routine included sumptuous meals prepared by her personal chefs, featuring a staggering choice of 32 dishes served on silver plates. She definitely lacked for nothing. <laughs> Occasionally permitted outdoor excursions under strict supervision, Mary spent seven summers at the spa town of Buxton, where she likely sought relief for her declining health. Despite all of her privileges, her physical well-being deteriorated over time, possibly exacerbated by conditions such as porphyria or the lack of regular, ec regular exercise. By the 1580s, severe rheumatism afflicted her limbs, rendering her lame. In May 1569, Elizabeth attempted to broker Mary's restoration to power in exchange for assurances of the Protestant religion. However, a convention held at Perth resoundingly rejected this proposal. Meanwhile, the Duke of Norfolk continued to conspire for a marriage with Mary, leading to his imprisonment in the Tower of London from October 1569 to August 1570. The following year, the assassination of the Earl of Moray, Mary's half-brother and current regent of Scotland, occurred amidst an unsuccessful rebellion in Northern England led by Catholic earls. This uprising further fueled Elizabeth's apprehension regarding Mary's potential threat. In response, English troops intervened in the Scottish Civil War, bolstering the anti-Marian factions. Elizabeth's principal secretary, William Cecil, and Sir Francis Walsingham closely monitored Mary's activities with the aid of spies embedded within her household. In 1571, William Cecil and Francis Walsingham the latter serving as England's ambassador to France at the time, uncovered the Rodolphi plot. This intricate scheme aimed to oust Elizabeth I from the throne and install Mary with the assistance of Spanish troops and the Duke of Norfolk. Norfolk paid the ultimate price for his involvement, facing execution, while the English Parliament introduced a bill to bar Mary from ever rising to the throne an act that Elizabeth surprisingly refused to endorse. To further tarnish Mary's reputation, the incriminating casket letters were publicly disclosed in London. Despite these setbacks, plots revolving around Mary persisted. In the latter half of the 1570s, Pope Gregory XIII endorsed a plan to wed Mary to John of Austria, the governor of the Low Countries and the illegitimate half-brother of Philip II of Spain. This union was intended to facilitate an invasion of England from the Spanish Netherlands. Mary, meanwhile, communicated with the French ambassador, Michel de Castelnau, via encrypted letters, many of which weren't deciphered until 2022 and 2023. Following the Throckmorton plot of 1583, 
where Walsingham, now serving as Elizabeth's principal secretary, played a central role. Measures were enacted to safeguard Elizabeth's reign. These included the introduction of the Bond of Association and the Act for the Queen's Safety. These legislative acts sanctioned the execution of individuals involved in plots against Elizabeth and aimed to prevent any potential successor from benefiting from her demise. In 1584, Mary proposed an association with her son James. She expressed readiness to remain in England, renounce the Pope's bull of excommunication, and withdraw from her claims to the English crown. Additionally, she offered to participate in an offensive league aimed against France. For Scotland, Mary advocated for a general amnesty, endorsed James's marriage with Elizabeth's consent, and agreed to maintain the status quo regarding religion. Her only stipulation was the immediate improvement of her captivity conditions. Despite James initially entertaining the notion, he eventually rebuffed the proposal and formed an alliance treaty with Elizabeth, effectively disavowing his mother. Elizabeth too rejected the association, citing her distrust of Mary's intentions to cease plotting against her during the negotiations. In February 1585, William Perry was found guilty of plotting to assassinate Queen Elizabeth, a plot in which Mary had no prior knowledge, although her agent Thomas Morgan was implicated. This event led to Mary's transfer to the stricter custody of Sir Amias Paulette in April. By Christmas of that year, she was relocated to Chartley, a moated manor house. The Babington plot, a scheme to assassinate Elizabeth and replace her with Mary, culminated with Mary's arrest on August 11, 1586, while she was out riding. Walsingham, seeking to incriminate Mary, orchestrated a plan to intercept her correspondence from Shartley. Believing her letters to be secure, Mary unwittingly revealed her involvement in the plot to assassinate Elizabeth. Her letters were deciphered and scrutinized by Walsingham, providing damning evidence against her. Following her arrest, Mary was transferred to Tixel Hall in Staffordshire, before ultimately being imprisoned at Forthinghay Castle on 25th of September, after a four-day journey. In October, she was subjected to trial for treason under the Act for the Queen's Safety. The court, consisting of 36 noblemen, including William Cecil, the Earl of Shrewsbury, and Francis Walsingham, presided over the proceedings. Despite Mary's spirited defense, where she vehemently denied the charges and protested against the lack of access to evidence and legal counsel, she was found guilty of treason. As a foreign anointed queen, Mary argued that she could not be convicted of treason against England, as she had never been an English subject. Despite the verdict, Queen Elizabeth hesitated to sign the death warrant, wary of the political repercussions and the precedent it would set to execute a fellow queen. Pressure mounted from the English Parliament to carry out the sentence, but Elizabeth remained hesitant. She feared retaliation from Mary's son, James, who could form alliances with Catholic powers and pose a threat to England. In a clandestine attempt to expedite Mary's execution, Elizabeth approached Sir Amias Paulette, Mary's final custodian, asking if he would find a covert means to shorten the life of Mary. However, Paulette, guided by his conscience and sense of posterity, refused to comply with the request. Eventually, on February 1st, 1587, Elizabeth signed the death warrant and entrusted it to William Davidson, a privy counselor. The execution was carried out swiftly and secretly. On February 3rd, without Elizabeth's knowledge, 10 members of the Privy Council of England convened and decided to execute Mary immediately. At Forthinghay Castle on the evening of February 7th, 1587, Mary was informed of her impending execution scheduled for the following morning. She spent her final hours in prayer, distributing her belongings to her household and writing her will and a poignant letter to the King of France. The scaffold erected in the Great Hall was draped in black cloth, a solemn setting for the tragic event about to unfold. With dignity and courage, Mary faced her fate, kneeling on a cushion provided for her on the block. 
Earls of Shrewsbury and Kent bore witness to the execution, solemn witnesses to the end of a chaotic reign. In the moments before her execution, Mary, Queen of Scots, displayed grace and composure, forgiving the executioner and his assistant, as was tradition, and acknowledged the end of her troubles with a serene smile. With her faithful servants by her side, she removed her outer garments, but remarked on the peculiar circumstances of her removing her clothing in the company of such witnesses. Always leave them with a joke, right? <laughs> Blindfolded with a veil embroidered in gold, Mary knelt before the block, her arms outstretched in a final act of surrender. Her last words were, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. The execution, however, was not swift or clean. The first blow of the axe missed its mark, striking the back of her head, before the second blow severed her neck, save for a small sinew. With one final stroke, the executioner completed his task, raising her severed head and declaring, God save the queen. At that moment, the auburn tresses in his hand turned out to be a wig, and the head fell to the ground, revealing that Mary had very short, gray hair. Reports vary on the aftermath, with some claiming her lips moved for a quarter of an hour after her death, and others recounting the emergence of her loyal dog from hiding among her skirts. Despite claims of relics from her execution, including her clothing and the block, being sought after, contemporary accounts state that all such items were destroyed in the fireplace of the Great Hall, denying relic hunters any tangible mementos of Mary's final moments. Upon learning of the execution, Elizabeth expressed indignation, insisting that Davidson had acted against her wishes by parting with the warrant and that the Privy Council had exceeded its authority. Elizabeth's deliberate ambiguity in her instructions allowed her to evade direct culpability for Mary's death. Davidson paid the price for this confusion, being arrested, imprisoned in the tower, and ultimately found guilty of misprison. He was released nearly two years later, following intercession on his behalf by Cecil and Walsingham. Mary's final wishes regarding her burial were also met with resistance from Elizabeth. Despite Mary's request to be laid to rest in France, Elizabeth refused, and instead her body was embalmed and temporary, temporarily interred in a lid coffin. Eventually, Mary was buried in a Protestant service at Peterborough Cathedral in late July 1587. Her entrails, separated during the embalming process, were secretly buried within Farthinghay Castle. Years later, in 1612, Mary's son, King James VI of Scotland and I of England, ordered her reinterment in Westminster Abbey, opposite the tomb of Elizabeth. The opening of her tomb in 1867 was part of an attempt to locate the resting place of her son, who was ultimately found with Henry VII. Mary's vault became the final resting place for many of her descendants, including notable figures such as Elizabeth of Bohemia, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, and the children of Anne, Queen of Great Britain. Assessments of Mary throughout history have been deeply divided. In the 16th century, Protestant reformers like George Buchanan and John Knox vilified Mary, portraying her as a villainous figure. Conversely, Catholic apologists such as Adam Blackwood praised, defended, and eulogized her, empathizing her virtues and innocence. The ascension of her son James in England ushered in a new era of historical interpretation. William Camden, writing an officially sanctioned biography, condemned Buchanan's work as largely fictional and presented a more sympathetic view of Mary, focusing on her tragic circumstances rather than her character flaws. These differing interpretations persisted into the 18th century with historians like William Robertson and David Hume asserting Mary's guilt based on the authenticity of the casket letters. In contrast, William Teitler argued for Mary's innocence, highlighting inconsisten inconsistencies in the evidence against her. In the latter half of the 20th century, historians such as Antonia Frazier, Gordon Donaldson, and Ian B. Cohen sought to provide more balanced and objective accounts of Mary's life. Frazier, in particular, was praised for her nuanced approach, 
which avoided the extremes of adulation or condemnation seen in earlier biographies. This shift towards a more objective assessment allowed for a deeper understanding of Mary's complex legacy and the times in which she lived. Historian Jenny Wormald's assessment of Mary as a tragic figure who struggled to navigate the challenges of her time stands as the dissenting view in the post-Antonia Fraser tradition. Fraser's influential work, which portrayed Mary as a pawn manipulated by ambitious nobles, has shaped much of the contemporary understanding of Mary's life. Despite accusations of complicity in the murder of her second husband, Lord Darnley, and allegations of a conspiracy with the Earl of Bothwell, there is no concrete evidence to support these claims. Mary's courage in the face of her execution has contributed to her image as a tragic heroine. Her refusal to be betray her principles or beg for mercy has cemented her place in popular imagination as a noble victim of circumstance, caught in the midst of a turbulent and treacherous political landscape. The life of Mary, Queen of Scots, is a complex tapestry. From her early years as Queen in Scotland to her reign and eventual downfall, Mary's story is one of political maneuvering, religious strife, personal struggles, intrigue, and tragedy. Mary's legacy endures, captivating the imagination of historians, writers, and artists for centuries. Her story continues to fascinate as a compelling saga of power, betrayal, and resilience in Renaissance Europe. Mary, Queen of Scots, remains an enigmatic figure whose life and reign continue to inspire exploration and interpretation to this day. And so ends today's episode. Thanks to the books Mary, Queen of Scots by Antonia Fraser and Mary, Queen of Scots by Alison Ware for all the research help as well as the countless websites I've hit up for information. I hope to have you listen in to my next episode. I'm thinking of talking about the space race. You can find me on my Facebook page, ADHD History, and on Twitter, Blue Sky, Threads, Instagram, and YouTube at It's ADHD History. See you next time. <laughs>